Good morning. Our scripture passage on this Easter morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Hear the word of the Lord. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the risen Lord given to us on this Easter morning. Thanks be to God. Isn't it fun to worship on Easter? Amen. Well, let me tell you, when you understand Easter, when you understand the empty tomb that we're going to talk about today, every Sunday holds the same joy of gathering together and worshiping. Um, if you're new with us here this morning, my name is Steve Sherrill. I'm the pastor here at Payless Community Church. We are excited to have everybody here to celebrate Easter with us today because Easter is such a wonderful day of celebration Right? It's a time where we, where we feel hope and joy. See, the message that we worship a risen Savior, not only today, but every day, is something that we all need to be reminded of. And we just heard the words from our scripture that said, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. You know, these are probably familiar words to us. Today, though, I want us to focus on how the, the angel told the women, he's not here. The tomb was empty. Now, normally when things are found to be empty, it's not a good thing, right? If our bank account is empty, that's definitely not a good thing. In fact, that can make you feel uh, pretty, pretty scared, uh, hopeless, uh, anxiety, and insecure. If our cupboards are empty, that's also definitely not a good thing, right? What, a, what an absolutely terrifying feeling to not know how you might feed yourself or your loved ones. When our children grow up and, and leave home, leaving it, it empty of them and all of their friends, right? That might be good for our child's independence, but it's sad and, and sometimes confusing for parents who now have to find a, a purposeful way to fill the time that they had been spent raising their kids. My wife Katie and I have, have recently been shopping for a much-needed new car, only to find most of the car lots we go to empty. It's not a good thing. Now, although thankfully this is not a dire situation for us, it is a frustrating one. I'm sure we could all think of of so many more examples of how finding something 
empty can be scary and confusing, frustrating, and even hopeless. But on Easter, on Easter we're reminded of the good news of the empty tomb. Now over the last six weeks, we've been focusing on the cross that Jesus endured for us. We spent time throughout this season of Lent remembering what happened to Jesus after he was arrested and up to his crucifixion and death. We've looked at the different things that Jesus endured. We saw how they could easily be, be, and and pretty understandably, they, they could have been seen as negative things that happened to Jesus. And of course, none of the things that we talked about were good Right? Jesus suffering is not good. How he was mocked and, and beaten and humiliated, those things aren't good. Remember when the soldiers, they, they wrote Jesus off and started dividing up his clothing among themselves immediately after they had hung him on the cross? It seemed so horrible. But knowing that Jesus endured all of it on purpose, actually fulfilling multiple prophecies is such good news. And today we're going we're gonna to consider a one more concept that's often negative, that, that's often viewed negatively, but, but something that God used for our good. The empty tomb. See, the empty tomb was scary for anyone who was connected to or involved with Jesus' death. The disciples, the priests, And Rome, none of them expected an empty tomb. And so all of them immediately assumed that someone had taken his body. The disciples were afraid and sad because not only was their dear friend and teacher now dead, but now it seems that his body has been stolen. The Jewish priests are enraged Because they didn't want people to believe the stories of of the Messiah resurrecting from the dead. They didn't want those stories to spread to anyone. And then you've got Rome. Rome was concerned because they didn't want this empty tomb to cause a revolt against Caesar. So all three of these groups, yes, including the disciples, they still didn't totally understand who Jesus was. And so when the tomb was found empty, fear gripped them all. And there have been many who have speculated about the empty tomb, and those who still do today, saying that that Christ's body was indeed stolen. And I want to look at a few details that, that show how that speculation is false. So let's look at these three groups that I mentioned and, and see how it wouldn't have been prudent for any of them to steal Jesus' body. First, let's talk about Rome. Right? It would not profit Rome at all to steal the body because, as I already said, there was a huge risk of revolt. And so for this reason, the Roman soldiers who were guarding the tomb, they knew that if anything happened to Jesus' body, that they would pay with their lives. See, if this if this king of the Jews is thought to have actually come back from the dead, what would stop the Jewish people from then rising up against the Romans? And so to think that these Roman officials had Jesus' body taken goes against the agenda and the interests of Rome. For the same reason, the the Jewish priests They would not have stolen Jesus' body. See, they wanted his grave to remind everyone what would happen to anyone who doesn't fall in line with the religious authorities. See, Jesus' entire being challenged all of the traditions of the Jewish people, and so it was their their biggest priority to keep his body there, to prove that he was not the Messiah. We see in Matthew, let's look at Matthew 27, verses 62 through 66. It says this, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. 
Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So both Rome and the Jewish priests wanted people to believe that the disciples had taken the body. They even made a plan to spread a story saying that it was the disciples who had come and taken Jesus' body. Let's look now at Matthew 28, starting at verse 11. While the women were on their way, now these are, these are the women that, we just, that Jill read in our scripture earlier that had just seen the resurrected Jesus. So while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while you were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. See, the priests and the Roman soldiers created a plan. For the soldiers, the plan was to save their own lives. For the priests, the plan was to save their way of life. But if we were to think logically about this, we can see that the disciples never took Jesus' body. First, how can anyone believe that 11 men lacking military training would have been able to outwit and defeat trained Roman guards at the tomb? Right? These are guards who knew that their own lives were on the line if they failed. Right? These guards were trained. They, they knew how to keep watch, how to guard something. They weren't these average people prone to distraction and, and disobedience. They would not have been overcome with fatigue. They understood the basic concept of staying alert. Now, another flaw in this, this plan that the priests have devised is, is what we know about the disciples themselves. The disciples were not yet brave men. They were confused and terrified. They were so afraid that when Jesus was arrested, they ran. When he was beaten, they were absent. When he was crucified, they were still nowhere to be found. And when his body laid in the tomb, they were not even the ones who placed it there. All four of the Gospels note that the empty tomb was first discovered by women. This is significant in that it highlights the fear of the male disciples. Rather than visiting the tomb, they were all gathered together in a locked home. And on Sunday morning, it was the women who were brave enough to journey to the cross, to, to properly prepare Jesus' body now that the Passover was through. The disciples were still hiding, afraid for their lives. And so to believe that they suddenly mustered the courage to overtake Roman soldiers who were trained in this is just absurd. The next flaw in believing that Jesus' body was stolen is the hundreds and hundreds of witnesses who saw Jesus after he resurrected. If we had each one of those witnesses who, who witnessed Jesus after he resurrected, so they have seen the resurrected Lord. If we had each of them come up here this morning and, and give a talk for 15 minutes sharing their testimony of what they saw, we would be here all day and all night and Monday and Monday night and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and sometime early on Friday morning, they would just be wrapping up their testimony. It would take over 128 straight hours just to hear for 15 minutes each the testimony of all of those who saw the Lord 
after he rose from the dead. Now, another thing to consider is if the disciples stole the body, then they obviously knew that Jesus did not rise from the dead. They would have known if they'd stolen the body that he was still dead. Therefore, they would have known that this whole idea of resurrection was a myth. And it would have been a myth that they had concocted themselves. And if that were the case, they never would have have willingly and joyfully endured such persecution and eventual martyrdom. See, people don't, don't typically die horrible deaths for something that they know isn't true, unless, of course, they're certifiably insane. And think about who these disciples were. They were flawed men, still learning how to live the life that Christ was calling them to. Peter couldn't even admit that he knew Jesus, let alone die for him. So what changed him? What changed all of them? The empty tomb. See, stealing the body cannot account for for the radical change in the disciples' lives and their willingness to endure horrific oppression and rejection for their beliefs. But the empty tomb can. Because the empty tomb would lead to their encounter with the risen Lord. Have you ever considered that the tomb was empty even of Christ himself? Right? Jesus didn't just raise from the dead and wait around to show everyone. Right? Hello. Here I am. Right? He, he didn't sit around and wait. He had business to attend to. He had work that still needed to be done. And so instead of waiting to greet his disciples, he went to meet them. And he left an angelic messenger to explain the empty tomb. Right, an angel of the Lord, dressed in white, delivers the miracle of Easter morning like an administrative assistant explaining why you can't have a quick word with the boss. Oh, you're looking for Jesus? I'm sorry, you just missed him. Right, but you missed him because he has moved on ahead to other pressing business. The resurrected Lord had no intention of of giving us time to sit around pondering whether we believe in this sort of thing or not. Instead, the instruction that was given to the women is to, to go and tell the disciples that they had better get on the move. See, Jesus had explained earlier that after he was raised up, that he would go ahead of them to Galilee. And now the angel reminds them of this scheduled rendezvous. If it's Jesus that they want, they're going to need to head back to Galilee. And so what does the empty tomb mean for us today? See, this is a great story, and it's a wonderful tradition to relive every year. But church, it also applies directly to our lives today. The empty tomb to the child of God means that sin's ability to keep us from God is empty. That death's power to separate us from God is empty if we're a Christ follower. Anything in this world that could could keep us from knowing the love of Christ in our lives is empty. And it's all because the tomb of Jesus is empty. See, there's nothing that's more valuable than the emptiness of that place. But we too must leave the tomb. And the tomb speaks of death, but we're called to live as resurrection people. When we leave the tomb, when we leave the place of death and follow the risen Christ, we can empty ourselves of things such as worry and anxiety and fear and hopelessness and frustration and anger and bitterness because all of those things died with Christ. We can leave them behind in the tomb, allowing more room for God inside of us. We don't have to fear anything, even death itself. Pastor and author Dr. Paul Chappelle wrote this. He said, a little boy and his father were driving down a country road on a beautiful spring afternoon, and suddenly out of nowhere, a bumblebee flew in the car window. 
Since the little boy was deathly allergic to bee stings, he, he became petrified. His father quickly reached out and grabbed the bee, squeezed it in his hand, and then released it. But as soon as he let it go, the young son became frantic again as the bee buzzed around the little boy. The father sensed his terror and once again reached out his hand, but this time he pointed to his hand. And there, stuck in his skin, was the stinger of the bee. You see this? He asked. You don't have to be afraid anymore. I've taken the sting for you. Church, we don't need to be afraid of death because Christ has taken the sting out of death and sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57 says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we actually have victory in Jesus. But we must leave the tomb and meet our risen Savior. We can't hold on to fear and anger or bitterness Jesus is ready to change your life, but you must go and meet him. The reality that the tomb was empty was never challenged. When Peter preached at Pentecost in Jerusalem 50 days after the death of Jesus, no one challenged his claim that the tomb was empty. The question was not, was the tomb empty, but where is Jesus? See, for those of us who believe that, that he's alive... Everything has changed. We have hope. We have freedom. We have joy. And most importantly, we have a job to do. We have to tell others about the joy that we have. Because we get to live each day with our risen Savior. For people who don't live each day with their risen Savior, this world is a Sad, terrifying, anxiety-inducing, hopeless place. But we have a job to do. To live as resurrected people. To tell others about the hope and the joy and the peace that we have. Because Christ not only died for us, but he rose from the dead three days later, completely beating death. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you because the tomb is empty. On Easter, a lot of times we remember the cross and we thank you that you died for us. And, and on Easter morning, we want to, we want to take a, a moment just to thank you that you not only died for us on the cross, but that you rose again three days later. And that by your resurrection, it proved everything that you had said, every prophecy, every word that had come from your mouth. You defeated death, and you've defeated its power in our lives. And we praise you today for that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So church, I wanna, um, we're going to play a, a short little video here in just a second. It's a, it's a bit of a teaser video about something that I'm really excited about. We have... Uh, a new mission partnership. And, and over the next four weeks, we're going to start next week, so this is a little Easter teaser. Uh, starting next week in each one of our services for the next month, we're going to be uh, digging a little deeper, diving in a little bit more as to what this new mission partnership is all about. We are partnering with uh, an organization called Children's Cup, and we're partnering with them in Belize, uh, a community um, in Belize, a small community called San Jose Village. And we have uh, created a new church partnership with a church there that is called Fountain of Life Church. And we're going to be, we are already, our mission team is already committing to and sponsoring uh, their church, and they're doing what is considered a feeding program for kids. Uh, they feed over 50 kids three times a week. And uh, we're going to be partnering with them to move that from what's called a, an eMERGE site to a care point where we'll be able to do all kinds of discipleship uh, opportunities, Bible studies, medical care, 
tutoring for school, uh, all kinds of things that we are super excited to be a part of. We're also going to be able to sponsor kids. Uh, you can have an individual child to sponsor that is in that San Jose village uh, that is being uh, ministered to by the church that we are partnering with down there in Belize. And, uh, and we're also going to talk more about this throughout the next weeks. But I'm so excited just to kind of kick it off with this little teaser here on Easter, and we'll learn more about this uh, over the coming weeks. Let's watch that video. Hope. Hope fuels us to dream. Hope inspires us to live our lives to the fullest. Hope gets us through our darkest days because with it, we know the future is bright. Yet many children around the world suffer from a sense of hopelessness, living in survival mode, not knowing where their next meal will come from. Hoping, dreaming, and living in wonder can seem like mere luxuries. But at Children's Cup, we believe that hope is essential to a child's life, and our mission is to ensure that every child has an opportunity to receive it, because we know that hope's name is Jesus. Through serving nutritious meals, we are able to take care of a need and open their hearts to the love of Jesus. And when they experience His hope, they begin to dream big. Where they've once been told they will never amount to anything, they're now claiming their identity as a child of God. God who has plans for their brightest future. No matter what they've been through, they know that Jesus has a purpose for their lives. And with Children's Cup's help, they can see their dreams come true. We believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that these precious children will grow up to change their world from the inside out. It all starts with a simple meal, but it's so much more. Together, with these kids, we are changing the world. Giving hope, inspiring dreams, changing worlds.